Hello! Today's presentation is about U.S. wheat market, its main demand and supply drivers. Wheat is the third U.S. field crop behind corn and soybeans in planted acreage production and gross farm receipts. Unlike corn and soybeans, wheat era planted and harvested has been on a decline since 1980. This downward trend is due to lower relative returns for wheat, changes in government programs that give farmers more planting flexibility, and increased competition in global wheat markets. We begin with an overview of the main producers, consumers, exporters, and importers of wheat in the world. In 2020-21, China, European Union, India, Russia, and U.S. produced 65% of world's wheat. The top five wheat consumers are the same as the top five producers. The largest exporters of wheat are Russia, European Union, Canada, US, and Australia, whereas the largest importers are Egypt, Indonesia, China, Turkey, and Algeria. Now let's look at the US wheat market, where the wheat is grown, its varieties, and uses. In 2021, U.S. produced about 1.65 billion bushels of wheat, or 45,000 metric tons. In 2021, 62% of wheat were grown in Kansas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Texas. Kansas and North Dakota are the largest wheat-producing states, comprising about 34%. There are three varieties of wheat, winter, spring, and durum. Winter wheat is planted in the fall. Winter wheat plants go dormant in winter but grow rapidly in the spring and are harvested in the summer. Spring and durum varieties are planted in the spring once the ground defrosts and are harvested in late summer and early fall. Three wheat categories are split into five classes based on their end use, hard red winter, hard red spring, soft red winter, white wheat, and durum. Table shows each wheat class, their production region, percent of total U.S. wheat production, protein content, and end use. Most wheat grown in U.S. is hard red winter, which is used to make all-purpose flour. The highest protein wheat is durum, which is used in making pasta. Most of the wheat is being consumed in food products. Bread, pasta, cookies, cereals. U.S. also exported about 47% of its total wheat use in 2020-21. A very small portion of wheat goes to animal feed and seed. One bushel of wheat is 60 pounds. Wheat kernels are milled into flour. One wheat kernel contains three components. Bran takes up about 14% of the kernel weight and is used to make whole wheat flour and animal feed. Endosperm takes up about 83% of kernel weight. It contains the most protein and vitamins and is the source of white flour. Germ takes up about 2.5% of the kernel weight. The germ is the embryo or sprouting section of the seed that has valuable vitamins, but not much protein. It is sold separately and used to make whole wheat flour. Whole wheat flour is made when all parts of a wheat kernel are milled and used, which means an extraction rate of flour from wheat is 100%. The most common is the white flour with an extraction rate of 72%, which means one bushel of wheat makes 43 pounds of flour. Figure shows how the price of wheat changed over time both in nominal and real dollars. In nominal terms, the price of wheat has been on a slow upward trend in the last 40 years. However, in real terms, wheat has become cheaper. When trying to estimate how the prices of wheat will behave, one needs to analyze the factors that affect its demand and supply. From Economics 101, we remember that a market price is determined by an intersection of demand and supply curves. The price can change when demand or supply curve move in or out. The components of wheat supply are beginning stocks, production and imports. 
with the production being the largest component. Beginning stocks are what is carried over from the previous year. Large stocks can provide additional supplies in a low production year, while small stocks provide less. Production is determined by the amount of acreage harvested and the yield per acre. U.S. imports very little wheat. In 2020-21, U.S. imported 3% of its total U.S. supply. Demand for wheat comes from food, exports, seed, feed, and other residual use and ending stocks. U.S. domestic wheat use grew 1.5% on average during 1980-2021. Table summarizes the main demand and supply effects on wheat prices. On the demand side, we have consumer preferences, prices of substitutes such as corn and soy, and international trade for exported wheat. On the supply side, there are government price support and subsidies, weather, and diversion of land to other crops. I describe each of these next. The first demand driver I focus on are consumer preferences. Wheat flour has been a staple in the Western diet for centuries. One of the drivers for wheat consumption is the population growth. Despite the steady growth in U.S. population, per capita flour consumption has been decreasing since late 1990s. One explanation is the switch to low carbohydrates and gluten-free diets. In the last two decades, more people in U.S. and in other Western countries are switching to wheat-free, gluten-free diets because of autoimmune disease, celiac, diabetes, perception that gluten is bad for one's health, weight loss aspirations, and other promised health benefits touted in mainstream media. Only 1% of U.S. population has celiac disease but it is estimated that 25% of U.S. population follow gluten-free diet. Arslane surveyed 3,000 U.S. residents who did not have a diagnosed gluten intolerance condition about their attitudes and experience with gluten-free diet. They found that most people decide to go on a gluten-free diet based on their personal research. They perceive gluten-free diet to be healthier, more nutritious, and can help clear acne. Some people also believe that avoiding wheat will help them lose weight. Unfortunately, there is no evidence to support this. Wheat competes with feed grains in the summer when wheat has been harvested, but feed grains have not. Feed wheat is used primarily during summer quarter, June, July, and August. Corn prices are higher in the summer months than during the remainder of the year. They are the lowest during the fall harvest. Graphs show summer and rest of the year prices for corn and wheat. On average, annual price premium of summer corn price over the price during the rest of the year was 14 cents per bushel during the period 1980-2021. In contrast, wheat prices are the lowest in the summer quarter than the rest of the year because of a summer harvest. On average, annual wheat prices were 25 cents per bushel higher during the fall, winter, and spring than during the summer quarter. Higher corn prices during the summer months would increase demand for wheat feed, subsequently raising the price of wheat. The last demand factor I will discuss is international trade. U.S. role as a wheat exporter has diminished with time. In 1975, its share of world wheat exports was 48%. In 2020, it fell to 13%. Demand is lower because of the new low-cost wheat producers, such as Russia, Ukraine, and Argentina, who started to dominate wheat exports market in the last 20 years. However, with the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, we have to wait and see if U.S. exports demand increases to cover the lost wheat due to the war. We now discuss the supply drivers and begin with government price support and subsidies. Historically, U.S. government has supported farmers' incomes through commodity price support, storage programs, and direct payments. The Farm Bill, a multi-year legislation, governs an array of agricultural and food programs. Current is 2018 Farm Bill. Similar to corn and soybeans, the wheat producers have access to price loss coverage 
agricultural risk coverage, and marketing assistance loan programs. PLC and RCS subsidies that farmers can receive to offset lower revenues if commodity prices are lower than what was expected. Producers can only choose to participate in either PLC or ARC. PLC offers protection against the decline in the crop price, whereas ARC in the crop revenue. Farmers can also participate in MAL program, which has been running since 1930s. MAL provides both a floor price and interim financing for certain commodities, which includes wheat. MAL offers producers short-term loans during harvest time, when market prices tend to be the lowest, allowing them to delay the sale of the commodity until market conditions improve. Farmers can receive a nine-month loan from a government by pledging some of their harvest to crop as a collateral. For each bushel put under a loan, the producer receives a payment equal to that year's loan rate. Under MAL program, the producer must give the crop designated as loan collateral in approved storage to preserve crop's quality. The loan can be repaid at any time during the nine-month period. If local market wheat prices were above the loan rate plus interest, a farmer would repay the loan and reclaim the crop. If market prices remain below the loan rate, then producers can either forfeit the crop, repay the loan at a lower rate, or take a loan deficiency payment in lieu of MAL. Figure shows that in the last 40 years, the loan rate has been below the market price, except in the early 90s in 1998-2000 when loan rate was higher than the average price received by the farmers, government wheat stocks accumulated, as was the case in the first half of 1980s. The Food Security Act of 1985 set U.S. agriculture on a more market-oriented course and reduced the price supports. Like any other grain crop, wheat yields depend on the temperature, moisture, soil type, and fertilizer application. Yields vary depending on the type of wheat in the growing region. Winter wheat has a higher yield potential than spring wheat because of a longer growing season. Wheat likes summer temperatures between 70 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of the reasons that farmers in the Pacific Northwest obtain higher yields than farmers in the Central and Southern Plains. Moisture is another factor that affects the yields. For example, Wheat yields have higher potential in the eastern states because of higher rainfall. If there is not enough rainfall, irrigation is applied to increase yields. Weather risk is perhaps highest in the southern plains because of the frequency of drought. In some years, the crop is not harvested at all, but given away for cattle to graze. Scientists conducted simulations of climate change impacts on global agriculture. If current climate change trends were to continue, the estimated average global crop yields for corn to decrease by 24% by late century and for wheat crop yields to increase by about 17%. The change in yields is due to the projected increases in temperature, shifts in rainfall patterns, and elevated surface carbon dioxide concentrations due to human-caused greenhouse gas emissions making it more difficult to grow corn in the tropics and expanding wheat's growing range. Wheat can be grown in the northern United States and Canada, North China Plains, Central Asia, Southern Australia, and East Africa as temperatures rise, but these gains may level off mid-century. The last supply driver I will explain is diversion of land to other crops. Graph on the right shows how U.S. wheat production has been declining over the last 25 years. At the same time, production of corn and soy has been on the rise. Two factors have been primarily responsible for this switch. First, the 1996 Farm Bill allowed farmers to plant any crop except for fruits and vegetables they wanted. Prior to that, the farmers were penalized if they planted a different crop than in the past or kept the land idle. Farmers had a choice to plant more profitable crops. Second, availability of genetically engineered seeds has encouraged farmers to switch from growing wheat to corn and soy due to more efficient wheat and pest control 
that make these crops easier to grow and make profits. There is no GE wheat grown commercially in the US, though some GE wheat has been found in some states in Canada throughout the years. Why has not GE wheat taken off? Because of a fear that anti-genetic engineering views held by some of our trading partners would hurt exports. Monsanto shelved GE wheat in 2004 amid market concern about rejection from foreign buyers. As of May 2022, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, and New Zealand have declared GMO wheat safe for consumers. A common relationship used to analyze how the commodity's equilibrium price changes in response to supply and demand is by looking at the price and stocks to use ratio. Stocks to use ratio is calculated by dividing the ending stocks by total use. Total use is the wheat used in food, seed, feed, and exported. Ending stocks is defined as what is left from total wheat supply for the year after subtracting total wheat use. Changes in ending stocks are inversely related to price. If total use rises relative to supply, ending stocks decline and price increases, and vice versa. FICA presents a scatter plot of average farm price versus stocks to use ratio for wheat. As expected, lower stocks to use ratios are associated with higher prices, whereas increase in stocks to use ratio leads to lower prices. Corn market impacts wheat market because wheat can be used to feed cattle, and farmers have switched to grow more corn to capture its profitability stemming from the ethanol boom and GE technology. I split data into two subsamples, 1980-2006 and 2007-2021. Like corn and soybeans, the relationship between wheat price and stocks to use ratio has changed after 2007. We can see that the price response to a change in stocks to use ratio is much greater after 2007. To conclude, I would like to explain the relationship between wheat and flour prices. We do not consume wheat kernels, but rather use flour to make products from wheat. Often, a commodity analyst needs to convert a price of wheat, dollars per bushel, into a price of delivered flour in dollars per pound. Table shows the steps to do this conversion, along with the underlying assumptions. Step 1. To get cash price, we add futures price and basis together. Futures price is the commodity price quoted on exchange for delivery at a certain time. Basis is the difference between cash price and futures price, and depends on distance from futures exchange, quality of wheat, storage, and local supply and demand factors. Step 2. To get flour prices in dollars per hundredweight, we multiply cash price by 2.3. 2.3 represents the number of bushels of wheat needed to generate 100 pounds of flour, assuming extraction rate of 73%. Step 3. Calculate the milfit credit. Milfit is a byproduct from milling wheat that is used to feed animals and is sold separately from wheat flour. 0 0.019 is a rate that converts milfit price in dollars per ton into dollars per hundredweight. Step 4. Get milling margin, or profit from milling flour, and it varies for different companies. It is also referred to as a block. Step 5. How much does it cost to deliver the flour? Varies by the truck size. Step 6. Put steps 2 through 5 to get a price of delivered flour. By the way, you can get basis and meal fit prices from Food Business News magazine. Thank you for listening and hope you watch my other commodities basics videos.